long as I got a seat in the kingdom, it's all right. God bless you. We're so happy for all of you that are here. A special welcome to all of our military people. We're glad that you're here. This is one of the Sundays that I look forward to probably more than all of them is to say thank you for your service that you give to this country. Uh, back in the day when my husband was in the military, people were being drafted. Uh, now as a volunteer, you go if you want to. And uh, he passed away 22 years ago, a soldier for 21 years. And so I am thankful that God has let us experience this to understand what you go through and want you to know that we're glad for you and we appreciate you and your service that you give to this country. We thank God for it. You didn't have to be here giving your life. It is a tremendous price to pay to be in the military. Let me tell you, you don't get rich in there, that's for sure. And back in the day, I mean, my, my check for me and my kids was $117. Uh, I know that's a lot more than that today. But that's what I got from the military, $117 a month. And so it has improved somewhat, but prices have gone up on everything else too. So we're thankful that you're here, glad that you're giving yourself in behalf of this country, helping other people as well as us. We thank you from the bottom of our heart. You didn't just have to be here. We're glad that you're here. And I hope this morning that you'll tune into the message and hear that God has been good to all of us. He's been good to our military. If you've been deployed and, and was in the war zone and come back, you can look up and say, thank you, God. Because I saw many, many caskets coming back on the plane and draped uh, caskets with the flag. And every time you see it, it makes you feel sad. And they used to have a thing every Sunday morning, ABC would have it on, and they would uh, give a list of all the men and women who have given their lives that week. And every time I looked at it, I felt sad because they were all young boys. I mean, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old who had never even began to live yet and already gone. And it used to bother me very bad on Sunday morning. I don't see it anymore. But I want you to know we appreciate you more than words can say. Give them another hand. I think they deserve it. Yes. So you don't have to work tomorrow. <laughs> She's got it all mixed up. I didn't think everybody here wants to want to believe they're not working tomorrow. Yes. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the second chapter of uh, Romans. Yes. Father, we're so grateful for your blessings, for all that you've done for us. And what a privilege it is to come to your house, to lift up your name, to worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray, God, that you would bless your people. I pray, God, that you would minister to their needs today. You know what they are before we even ask you. I pray, God, that you might be glorified in all that's said and done today. I pray, God, that you would continue to reach out to those that are yet in, in, the, in the battle zone and giving their life. I pray to this morning that you would have mercy upon these families, upon the men and women that sacrifice so much. I pray, God, for the anointing upon thy servant, for without you I can do nothing. With you I can do anything, and I'll give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The second chapter of Romans says, the second verse says, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges, that which do such thing and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? I want to preach a little while to you this morning. There's probably not a person in this room that knows that God is alive and well that don't believe that he is good to you. I don't believe anybody's an atheist in this country. I don't believe it. Because the word of God said it is in the hearts of man to know there is a God. That's something God put in all of us. But I say to you this morning, every person sitting here, you got up this morning, got ready for church, came down the street, and made it here. But if it had not been for God's goodness... 
you may not have even made it here this morning. I am thankful that every day that I get up, that I'm able to get up and dress myself and take care of myself because it could be so different. I want you to understand that people need to know one thing, if you know nothing else, that God is good to you. He loves you. He's good to you. He's always reaching out, doing whatever he can to show you that he loves. The greatest love that he ever showed us was when he sent his son to die on the cross for all of us and give us a chance that none of us really deserve. But I, I got to thinking about that. You know what? You cannot walk through this earth, period, without running into goodness. You know why? Because the scripture says his goodness fills the earth. So no matter where you go or where you're at, you're going to run into the goodness of God. Because God is good to man. What I think I have a problem with is that man is not good to God. And nobody wants to be taken advantage of. Nobody wants to be taken or treated like, oh, well, okay, thanks a lot, and move on. When you look at the world today, you see so many people who are not really getting in and giving God time in their life. They're busy with many things, but they're not giving God time. And, and oftentimes we'll say, I just don't have enough time. Every person in this country and around the world or to make it a point to get up every Sunday morning and say, I'm going to church to tell God thank you for this week. He didn't have to give it to you. Yes. Every person on Sunday night, well, people don't believe in church on Sunday night. They believe Sunday morning is good enough. But to me, one day a week to say thank you, you got health. You've got strength. You can move about and take care of yourself. You have your right mind. You can think for yourself. You can get in your car and know where you're going. You know how many people don't have those things? I am grateful that God has given me or allowed me to have a good life. And be able to go around and reach out and help people and do all that I can that I might help them in some way. If you live this life and you have not done good for somebody, you haven't lived. We live because we are out there doing something for other people and helping them. But I look at God, you know what? God blesses people that don't even care about him. He still reaches out and touches their life. And even if they don't care, nobody loves you that much. Nobody. And I thought about how horrible is it for us to take God for granted. Well, okay, yeah, I'm up doing this. I mean, you're here this morning, but you don't just have to be here. You're breathing this morning, but you don't have to breathe. Every breath you breathe should be a thank you to God because he's the one that's allowing you to breathe. Every time I inhale and exhale, I'm doing it because he lets me do it. If you look at your life this morning and say, what have you given back to God for all his goodness to you, how he's reached out and touched your life and done all this, what have you given back to him? You know, everybody likes to receive, but how much do we give back? And so if God has been good to you, look at your life this morning. Ask the question. Ask yourself the question, what have I really done for him? And I'm, I'm pretty sure, for the most part, a lot of people are going to say, I can't think of anything I really do for him. Think about how he would feel. If you were good to your wife or your husband, and you showed it time and time again, I wonder... How would you feel if you always gave to your mate and gave to them and gave to them, but they never did nothing special for you? You still wonder, do you really care? If I can remember your time, can't you remember mine? Well, God has said, look, I sent my son to die for you. And I'm asking you if you appreciate it, would you please say thank you? Thank you by what you do, not by what you say. But I thank you for what you have given me because you owe me nothing. This morning, God doesn't owe me. He doesn't owe me.
owe you, you owe him. He's the one who's given everything. Yes. If we, if we're not careful, we spend our lives never looking up. My grandmother told me one time, she said, when we would come around the table to eat as kids, and you better eat fast because it ain't much on the table. And if you want seconds, you better do it real quick. And so we sit down to the table and just start eating real fast. And she said, did you say grace? No. We were waiting to eat. Hey, it's eating time. We ain't said grace. We ain't looked up to say thank you or nothing. She said, you know what y'all remind me of the hogs in the country? She said, they'll get up on an acorn tree, and acorns will be hitting them all on top of the head, and they never look up. They just keep eating acorns. But never look up to see where they're coming from. And that's exactly the way man is. He never looks up to say, God, thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for putting people in my life that are a blessing to me. Thank you, God, that I can, I can talk this morning. I have my right mind. I know where I'm going. I know what I'm going to do. I, I thank you for all the things that I never said thank you for. And I said to the Lord oftentimes when I'm in prayer, I said, God, for every person who didn't say thank you today, I said for them. For every person who don't appreciate you, I do for them. Because God deserves to be appreciated. He deserves to be treated fair. He, de he deserves for us to give something back. Yes. The goodness of God supposed to put you in a place where you say, I think I want to serve God. That's what the goodness is about. So I want you to repent. I want you to make it right. So this is the goodness of God. It worketh repentance. It's supposed to make you feel sorry for the sins that you're doing. It's supposed to make you reach out to God and say, Lord, do something for me. I want to do something for you because you've done something for me. How do we go every day and never say thank you? You know, I've got seven children. And you know what? They're not getting nothing from me if you don't say thank you. You come back again to see if you're going to get something. I didn't have to give you nothing. Now, when you were small, I was obligated to feed you, change your diaper, and spank your rear end when you got wrong, and all those good things. But I want my kids to say thank you. Not just saying that, but add something to it. See, real thank you always comes with gifts in hand. A real thank you. Because I thank you, but I thank you so much, I need to give you this. I want you to know this is how much I love you. David was king over, over, over Israel. He looked up, he said, what can I render to you, God? What can I give to you for all the benefits, for all the blessings that you have given to me? Not because you owed it to me, you gave it to me out of love and for no other reason. And I think man needs to stop for a moment and say, thank you, God, for what you've given me. You owed me nothing. You gave me everything. That you hear this morning is the goodness of God. The, the young man who got the $1,000, the goodness of God. The other servicemen who got their cards with their gas card and their... Uh, to go to dinner at fifty dollars, and I mean, come on, where where does all this come from? It couldn't come from me. It couldn't just come from our church. God has to bring something to us to do this. So, do we look up and say thank you, or do you only thank say thank you if it's a personal thing between you, you and God? You know, and I don't, you know, I just want to thank God for me. Let's thank Him for something else, though. Let's go out here for all the other things he's done. The time your life could have been snuffed away and God spared your life. The time you would have been lost and in a devil's hell, he made it possible for us to have a way out. I'm glad he came for me because when I think about it every day, I think, my God, the road I was on, I would have went to hell. I was self-destructive in every way. And God reached down to me and said, Rose, I love you and I want to help you. And ever since that day, 50 years ago, he's been helping me. It is God that's helping you to accomplish anything. Yes. 
sometimes we want to take credit for too much. When you say it's God that's helping me. I couldn't make this by myself. I remember one time, one gift that God has given me was uh, interior design. And I didn't get a, go, get a chance to go to school and get my degree for it because that's what I was getting ready to do when the Lord called me to preach. And I thought, well, I'm not going to have time to do this. I can't do both of them. I can't be called to the ministry and then go to school at the same time. That's not going to work. So what did I do? I had to make the decision that God called me to preach the gospel. And in interior design, I still could do it. I just didn't have a degree. To this day, I love to design. Nothing makes me happier. And putting things together, I, it's so beautiful how God gives you all these gifts. And, 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 and in, in that, sometimes I could get a whole vision of something, how it should be done, and put it together, put it together. It is unbelievable. But I would not trade this for interior design due to the fact this is more important that any other, any other career I could have had, this is more important. Because God is saying, Rose, I trust you enough to trust you with my word. That when you stand in front of my people, that you can tell them the truth of what I'm saying here. That's more important to be trusted with something as valuable as the word of God. There is nothing else in the world greater than that. I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't go anywhere else, do anything else. This is my life. This is my thank you to God. When I come to church and preach the gospel, that's my thank you to God. Every time I reach out and touch somebody else's life, this is my thank you to God. I can't thank him enough. If I, David said if I had 10,000 tongues, he said I still couldn't thank him enough. Well, my God, we got one people here with one tongue not saying anything. And every day walk around with your life and do your own thing and, and feel good about it. But you know what? If you accomplish anything in this world, it's because God helped you to do it. If you went to college and you graduated from college, it's because God helped you to do it. If you could even get an assignment and understand it and comprehend what they've given to you, God did that for you. And thank you for putting in my heart a desire to say thank you again and again and again. I feel like every day I get up, if I wake up in the middle of the night, I say thank you, God. Thank you for that I can sit up on the side of the bed, that I can look around my room, that I can read my Bible, that I can get down and pray. Thank you for that. Thank you. I am convinced that nobody in this room wants to be taken for granted by nobody. We get real irritated when you do that. You're just using me. You're taking advantage of me. Nobody wants that. And I'm wondering, do you understand that God don't like it either? Do you understand? He said, what about me? Do I count at all? Am I important? Because we put him so far in the background of our lives. And then God is saying, hey, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't even be alive. We said, well, I got to spend time with my family. But you wouldn't have a family if it wasn't for God. You wouldn't have a lot of things if it wasn't for God. So stop for a minute. Thank you for this baby. Thank you, God, for all that you've given me. Thank you that I'm able even to give birth to a baby. Thank you. That is a miracle in itself. To this day, science cannot figure out how a baby grows in the womb of a mother. They've never been able to figure it out. How, how does all this come together? How do you actually have a living little person inside of you kicking you in your belly? Stretching out. I remember when I was pregnant with my twins. God help. I never thought in a hundred million years I'd have twins. And I already had four kids, so I sure wasn't looking for no twins. And I remember, this is amazing. When those babies first get in your, in your belly, you don't really have any feeling that they're there. But as time goes on, and as they begin to grow, that's why at nine months, they say, I got to get out of here. Ain't no room in here. Because at this point, I'm just too big. I got to turn around. I got to move. Well, I had two babies in me. Wasn't very big babies. 
but sometime one of the babies would change places and get up here at the top of my stomach and have the nerve to stretch. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I'm trying to breathe, and he wants to stretch right now. And I am so miserable and uncomfortable. This is a live human being inside of you who's stretching, who's moving around, and sometimes their knee will, will push your belly out, and sometimes they'll ball up in a knot, and the little buttocks will be sitting up here. And over there. I mean, it's, that's a miracle that any little uh, thing that has life can actually live inside of you, and God set a time for it to be delivered, and then it just automatically knows it. So you say, I'm going to the hospital. You're not going until the time comes. I never. I had an early birth with the twins. They were the only ones. I went seven months. The rest of them was four, nine months, and kind of leaning toward a few more days. But how good is God to give you these little, cute little things? You don't know what they're going to do after they get here after a while. But they are so beautiful. And you just sit there and look at them, and it's, every time I see a little baby on, on, on commercial, I think, if that's not the cutest little thing, would I ever want another one not on your life? <laughs> no. But I think it's so cute to have that commercial where they're doing the, doing the diaper, and the little baby just, cur cur just curls up on her chest, and, and she's just as fat and cute, little fat cheeks, and I'm just sitting there just, oh, that is the cutest thing. Do I want another one? No. I had my cute days. I'm not looking for new ones. But when I think about only God could put that inside of you, and at a certain time, automatically, you go into labor and deliver. Nobody but God. How in the world can you even deliver a live human being? It seems impossible. Except with God, all things are possible. I never was concerned much about having boy or girl. I wanted them to be healthy. God, just let me have a healthy baby. Because you see a lot of babies come in this world. It's, it's tragic. I remember a lady, one of my neighbors in Oklahoma, during the time had a baby. And I went over to her house to congratulate her and to see her baby. And boy, did I get a surprise. I, did, I was left speechless. The baby was the prettiest thing I ever saw, except what was weird, he had no brain. And I, I said to her, he has no brain? She said, no, he doesn't have a brain. How is he living? How is he living? The prettiest baby. But his little eyes kept going back and forth around in his head without any control and I didn't know what to say because I never seen a baby that was born without a brain and I wonder how is this baby living only God can make something live like that and I looked at, at the mother and she loved this baby in spite of the fact that it was so deformed and it grew and it became even prettier and prettier. But it, the little, it was so sad. There was no moving around and growing and moving their little arms and doing all this stuff. All this stuff didn't happen. And I just say to the Lord, just let him be healthy. Just let him be healthy. The only time I asked for a boy was when I had two girls and Charles said, I want a son. I said, Lord, give me a boy. One I should have left. He has caused me more problems. I wish I'd have never prayed that prayer. But uh, <laughs> nothing you can do about it. And I look at this, I think, God, thank you for how you have ordered my life all this time. When I didn't have no idea which way my life was going, God knew where I was going. He was in front of me, guiding me, and leading me all of my life when I didn't even realize it was God. When you escape danger where you were, or you just miss having an accident, or a car just missed you, or a gun just missed you, you better look up and say, thank you, God. Yes. You, you, 
you go you go to Afghanistan or or to Iraq and you and you see people dying all around you and you're still standing how is that what do I say I have to say thank you because I could have been him I don't believe in this stuff about uh, about guilt and I'm going through a lot of t trouble about guilt nobody has to feel guilty if your friend died and you didn't you should say thank you why am I guilty about what you didn't shoot him if you'd have taken away his life or her life, you would have every reason to feel guilty. But this is an enemy here. And I escaped. How did I escape? Because God had mercy on me. God looked out for me. When I didn't even know the bully was coming, I, when I didn't even know where the enemy was, somehow, by the grace of God, I got out. Should I look up and say, thank you for your goodness to me? <laughs> Sometimes people do wrong and do wrong and do wrong, and, they, and God hates sin. He hates sin. And man continually sin day after day, month after month. He constantly sinning. And, but, but the scripture says, because God does not punish uh, sinners instantly, people oftentimes feel it's safe to do wrong. But if you know God hates something, why would you do it? If you know that sin is an abomination to God, why do you do it every day? Because it surely says that you don't love him. It surely says you don't care about him. You're continually sinning knowing that the God we serve hates sin. That's why he sent his son to make it all right for us. To, I mean to fix it for us. So we have the power over sin. Do you think he's happy when he sees you committing sin? You're drinking booze. You're at the club and you're going all through the stuff. And you own drugs and you're doing this and all this. All the things that the word tells us we shouldn't do. In the Bible, if you want to know what God loves, Read your Bible. You want to know what he hates? Read your Bible. It is here. And if I know something that you don't like, if I love you, do I just ignore that and keep going and call it love? It's not love. But love says, he's watching me. He's looking at me all the time. The scripture says the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth. He sees everything. Nobody has a secret. Nobody can go to any place where God can't find you. And so if I know that, then am I not cautious how I live my life every day? Am I not cautious that somehow he would be offended or I'm hurting him because he's made it possible for me not to do it and I'm not even using it? Think about it. What should I be doing? Every time you sin, you should think, wow. I've got to stop this. Why? The God that loved me enough to give his son his life for me. The least I can do is respect him and say, I'm going to give you my life. I surrender my life to you. You were willing to give your life for me. I give mine back to you. People don't even want to go to church on a Sunday. Don't even think about middle of the week. That's not going to happen. On a Sunday, would you like to go to church? No, not really. But you, can you imagine if he's got feelings, and he does, and he says, no, I don't want to go to church. That's about him. That's about God. So do I, do I just take go to the side and say, I'm not going to worry about it? I just don't want to go today. Or I'm not into God's stuff, they say. I'm not into that. I'm not a religious fanatic. God didn't ask any of us to be fanatics. He asked us to love him. To love him back. I love you. Love me back. Take time for me. I take time for you. We don't mind when trouble comes in our life. Say, Lord, have mercy. Oh, honey, I fell on my knees. I started praying. Did you pray before then? Otherwise, you're trying to take advantage of a good God who loves you. And so I'm just going to, I don't know. It's just, uh, uh, I, I know I should do better, but you can do better. Because he made it possible for us to do better. So since I know that, why am I not doing that? I know he's good to me. You took me through all these years. Took me through all of the different places and dangers and things. Sometimes I didn't even know it was danger to after the fact. You took me through all these things. Don't that deserve a thank you? I want to say I love you.
you, God. I love you. Yes. A lot of people think they're getting away because God says, I don't readily afflict man. I don't readily come and get him and, and, and punish him for what he's done. I give him time to say, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to get my life together. See? If some of our men, our military people, have been to Afghanistan and been in the war, some of our men have been there two or three, two or three tours, every time you come back, how did I make it back? Because some people went two or three times and never got back. On one of those times, it took them out. So you got to say, well, do I owe him something? Of course. I am in debt to God. I am in his debt. And if I live to be 100 years old, I will still die in his debt. Because you can, give, you can never give back to him all that he's given to us. Oh, what a great God we serve. But we act like he's not really important. You know what? We are all created in the image of God. Therefore, if we're in the image, he has feelings just like we have. He get hurt. He's, he, he, he can get hurt over what you say and what you do. When you just kind of shove it to the side and I'm not going to worry about it. Or say something bad against somebody that you know you shouldn't have. He's listening to you. The little poem we used to have at home, at home says... He's the unseen guest at every table. He's the unseen guest in your house. He's the unseen protector in your car. You say, I don't know how I made it out of that. I thought about when my son-in-law, Amos, had that accident. He should have been dead. That car spin around, turned upside down with all of the top, all the hood of the car all crushed in and is laying on his top. How did you survive that? The uh, other policemen, the hospital, everybody, huh, this man should be dead. He crawled out of the car with a scratch on one arm. What is that? If I don't know that that's God, something's wrong with me. If I don't know that's a miracle, something is wrong. That's a miracle that you survived that. That's a miracle you got out. And he kept everybody laughing. After he got out, you go over to visit him. He said, I just said, rrr, rrr. And, and my husband, poor fellow, he was laughing till he was in tears. He said, Amos is crazy. I mean, he's laughing about this accident that could have been his life. But God was there looking out for him. And sometimes when you ain't even serving God and things could have happened to you, and you say, how did I get through that? God got you through that. Yes. It's the goodness of God. Not because you were good. Not because you remembered him. But because I love you. I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to help you every chance I can. I'm going to, if I see danger, I'm going to try to try to prevent you from having your life destroyed. Or suddenly you go to the doctor and the doctor says you have cancer and you have three months to live. Three months. What do we do? We panic. We get in a panic. And say, Three months? All of a sudden, everything in your world has changed. Everything. And you're looking at the situation and saying, you know what? Three months is a short time. If they told you you had a year to live, short time. And we never know where we are or what's going on inside of our bodies. You can take care of your body every day and still you'll get something you never dreamed you would get. I've heard people say, I was healthy, I worked out every day, I ate right, and how did I get cancer? <laughs> Nothing says that if you do all these things that you won't get cancer. Right. People get it. People get cancer of the lungs that never smoked. So you got to look at your life and say, you know what? The, I mean, the fact that I'm breathing today, and I'm not having any pain, and I feel so good, oh. That requires a great big thank you. A great big thank you. Yes. God is so good. <laughs> Listen to this. This is in the other version that I wrote from the Bible. And it, it says it in this language you may understand better. You may be saying, what terrible people you have been talking about but want a minute 
Amen. You are just as bad as the person that you're talking about when you're doing the same thing they're doing. Then he goes on to say, you are just as bad. When you say they are, are wicked and should be punished, you are talking about yourself. He goes on to say, for you do the, these very same things that they do. How can you say to the man on the post, the woman on the post, hey, have, have you gone to church today? You didn't go. And then when you did come, we didn't see you till Christmas or Easter. You don't visit God just on holidays. I happened to make me a sign for my house this year of, uh, for the Christmas decoration, and it says, let us celebrate Jesus. It's not your birthday. It's not yours. But you would think as many gifts as we like to get. That the, oh, my God, thank you. Thank you. It's not your birthday. We ought to take the time to celebrate him because he's the one that made it all possible. But we so quickly forget. It goes on and said, we know that God is justice, and he will punish us. Uh, anyone who does such thing as these for a sin is concerned, do you think that God will judge and condemn others for doing uh, uh, their sin and overlook you? It's not going to happen. It goes on to say, don't you realize, hold on, don't you realize or don't you even care can you see that he has been waiting all this time without punishing you to give you time to turn from your sin? It's not because he condoned it. He said, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not a good person, but God's good to me. Well, why don't you try being good to him? That'll work real good for you. And this goes on to say his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, to come to him and say, God, I'm sorry. That's what his kindness is about. But you won't listen. And so you are saving up terrible punishments for yourselves because of your stubbornness in refusing to turn from your sins. He will terribly punish those who fight against the truth of God and walk in evil ways. God will punish sin anywhere he finds it. So you ask yourself, am I sinning today? What are you doing that's sin? And if I am, God, I want you to forgive me. I'm going to change my life with your strength, with your help. And I'm going to get through this because it's about time I pay up. It's about time I give back. It's about time that I do something for you. Why not? God's sitting on the throne and said, well, he don't need anything. Yeah, he's got everything. But he made you because he wanted you to be his family. And, and you know what? You don't want to be a part of it. You don't want to be a part of it. Because I'm not, no, I don't want to do that. I've got other things. I've got other plans. Don't ever plan your life without God in it. I can tell you, you will live to regret it. And people say, I don't know why everything went wrong. It went wrong because you left God out of it. See? You have to include him to be able to have something. Uh, my daughter one time went in the kitchen and made some tuna. And she came back and said, Mama, the tuna looks real funny. I said, well, what's, what do you mean it looks funny? It don't look like tuna. So I go in the kitchen. I said, well, where's the tuna? <laughs> she got the eggs. She got the salad dressing. She got everything mixed up. and no tuna in there. It ain't tuna salad without the tuna. And that's the same way with your life. It ain't nothing without God. You're not living anything without him. You look funny. People just say, boy, you look funny. What's wrong? Well, God ain't in here. When he comes in, you start looking normal. That's why we got so many stressed out people all over the world. You see them every day. You see them in the store walking down the street. You say, what's wrong with you? Everything that could go wrong went wrong. It doesn't with God. Because he, he wants us to have happiness. He wants us to have joy. He said, I came that you might have life and more abundant life. I want to teach you how to live. I want to teach you how to be happy. But we don't want him. Because we think that we already know what makes us happy. And the truth is, it is not in man to know himself. 
That's what the scripture says. It's not in you to know. So God says, see, I'm going to fix it for you. Since I know you don't know how to do things, hey, give him a chance. My life has never been better. I gave my life to the Lord in my mid-20s, and I've never regretted a day. Every day has been a good day because he's in it. But I always take time to think. Sometime in the, going down the street or just in the middle of the day for no apparent reason, thank you. Thank you. You know, it, it means something when you say thank you to somebody. And it's not Christmas. Thank you. Do it every day. You could do that every day to God and nobody would know you did it. In your car, going down the street, thank you. When you reach your destination, thank you. When you got from A to B to C to D and you didn't get cut off in the midst, thank you. When you drove up to this building this morning to church, you should be saying, thank you, I got here safe. As many people started out and didn't get here safe, but I got here safe. When I leave from here and go home, you know, most accidents the people are in is just a few miles from their home. So, can I thank God for being here? See, one, one, one night we left church, me and my daughter, and coming out of the Briargate shops was a, a, a woman driving a car. And I don't know how, she, how in the world she didn't see this car. Sometimes people's minds somewhere else. You ever been driving? You ever been driving down the street and the light turned red? You thought it was green? Or you didn't think nothing? <laughs> Just kept driving. You ever drove, have you ever driven someplace and when you got there say, wow, I'm here. Did, don't know how you got there. That woman just came out. I don't know where her mind was. Now it could be, it could be texting. It could be any cellular issue. The lights change, turn green. They don't even know it. They have to blow the horn. Hey, lights green. It's, it's unbelievable. But you know what? But when you really let God come with you, ride with you, he won't ride with you at 90 miles an hour. You're, you're by yourself. <laughs> if you're driving the speed limit, he's with you. Go ahead and drive your limit. He's not there. From the time you pressed that, that, ca that, that gas and started it going and it kept raising the hand, comes out, and when it passed the speed limit, God's gone. I'm there with you, but you want to be a fool? I don't ride with fools. <laughs> Going to mess up your own life? Slow down. Ask the Lord to ride with you. You always get to your destination safe. And then you can say, Paul, he's so good to me. And then there should be a part of you say, I'm going to church Sunday. It should be some of you sitting here this morning. You know, he's so good to me. I think I'll give him Sunday night too. You don't mind giving extra on the job? If your job call you today and say to you, um, um, I need you to come in for a few hours. You would say, thank God for that overtime. I could use the money. <laughs> and you just go on out there and go to work. You know, they call me. I got to go in. Not even offended. Ask him to come back to church. <laughs> well, <laughs> when I sat at the desk over there and they used to come by and I sat at the desk, I said, are you coming back tonight? Well, I don't want to lie to you. I said, don't, just come back. <laughs> you don't have to lie. You can just say, yeah, I'll be back. But they're standing at the desk feeling this sense of guilt. That I really should, but no, I think I'm going to have a beer. <laughs> Sit down and watch a movie. Have some family time. You know you can have family time six days a week. And you just can't give God just a few more hours in the evening. Back in our day, you were staying home to watch Gunsmoke or, or Hawaii Five-0 or Barnaby Jones. I love those shows. But it comes a time, and now in our day, you can fix that. If you, if you if something's on TV that you really wanted to see, just TV it. Come on to church. Well, I'd rather see it when it first come on. you full of crap. you full of crap. As long as you can see it, what difference does it make? If I look at it later, or I look at it when it first comes on. 
Think about it. What time are you giving God? What kind of thanksgiving are you giving him? You, you know what? And the minute something goes bad and you can't move, then we say, I just want the Lord to help me to get up and walk again. I want him to help me to, you know, be able to see. I'm not, my, one of my eyes are out and the other one's going too. And I just want to see. What do you want to see for? Not to see God. But just so I can do my thing. You wouldn't like it if somebody used you just for doing their thing. But no, they come back and say, you know what? Man, I just wanted to thank you. When Jesus uh, healed of the ten lepers, they didn't even come back. To, now, you are dying. Anybody who got leprosy is death. He heals them, gives them their life back. One, one out of the ten returned to say, thank you. He said, where are the nine? Where are the other ones? Don't really matter. I just want what you got. I don't want to live for you. Come on. A lady came to this church one time who had cancer uh, and didn't have long to live. And they brought her up in a wheelchair. And I asked her, I said, Do, if the Lord heals you, would you give your life to him? She said, no. I thought, oh, it's like that. You want what he's got, but you don't want to give him nothing in return? So just heal me, God, and give me my life back, but I'm not hanging around for you. That sounds bad to all of us. But our actions show all of that. But she just said, no, I don't want to serve God. I just want to be healed of cancer. Really? Well, if I was God, I sure wouldn't heal you. And he didn't. And he didn't. And she died shortly thereafter. How is it that, for the most part, we all live our life doing what we want to do from the time we uh, say we're grown and some of us feel like we were grown before we got there but uh, before I mean we done what we wanted to do the, everything was laid out we did it and we start getting older you know we still don't want God you still don't want to do nothing for him after all this time he says remember thy creator in the days of thy youth while you got strength while you can help him do something for him Remember me when you're young. Nope, too young. Serve God. Don't have time. I got some other things I need to do. I mean, I'm trying to get through and get graduated out of college and do this and do that. And to be truthful, I don't have the time. Oh, but when death comes for you. Death doesn't say, are you busy? Death doesn't look at you and say, oh, I come to pick you up, but you want me to come back tomorrow? It's not going to happen. When death comes for every one of us and every person in this building has an appointment with death and you are not going to tell death, I need you to come back. My wife's getting ready to have a baby. I'll see you in a bit. He's not coming back. He came to do a job. He's doing it whether you are ready or not. Larry McGee, wake up and listen to the word of God. That's tragic. What do you miss? Do you know how rude it is? For somebody to be talking to you and you go to sleep on them? You know how rude that is? That's what we do with God. It's like he's boring me, man. You know, what is it, God? What's going on? You know, I really don't know him. Do you want to know him? Well, I'm still young. Young people die and go to hell. Young people. You don't have to be old. Quit believing that, that I'm, I'm going to be here a while. No, you don't have to be here. How many people in this audience this morning came to church when you got up this morning, you thought, this is the day I'm going to die? How many people? <laughs> Think about it. Nobody thought this is the day they're going to die. You get on up, go on to church, go get some chicken after and eat some food. and You know, you're not thinking about it, I'm getting ready to die. And you could be. Because the Bible says in the hour when you think not, when you think that I'm not going to die now, he said, that's when death comes. So you don't know the hour nor the day when the Son of Man is coming, but he's coming. And so if I don't know, should I be preparing for that? Don't prepare. No, I don't believe I'm going to die today. You don't believe you're going to die tomorrow. Because you plan to go to work in the morning. I mean, not go to work, but have some barbecue or something. It's holiday. We decided to go down to the lake. You may not be going to the lake. Somebody may be going without you. 
Think for a minute. Any moment, any second, you could die. Any moment. One step, David said, between me and death, just one. The next step I make could be the end of my life. And you always say, boy, he died so young. He was so young. We have a problem when youth dies. When an older person dies, they say, well, you know, they, they, they've lived a good life. Think about it this morning. That if death would come for me today, can I be absolutely sure I'm going to heaven? Or more than likely I'm going to hell. I hope I, I, hope I don't. But your life dictates where you're going when this life is over. It shows where you're going by what you do every day. How you live your life every day. It is showing that. Okay? If you're not ready, be ready. Get ready. Thank God. But if you've given him nothing, how do you think he's just going, you're going to walk up to the gates of heaven and he says, welcome in, my son. Or my daughter, welcome in. You think so? You're really naive. You're somewhere on another planet. You're not even here. Because if you know this Bible, when death comes, he said, be ye also ready. You don't know the hour nor the day. So he said, be ready. Are you ready? Look at yourself and say, you know what? I've been saying I'm a Christian, but Sister Rose got to preach. I thought, am I a Christian? If you had to do that, you're not one. Well, then you may be the hypocrite that says, hey, I'm doing pretty good. No, I think I'll be here a little while. I can't stand these people on these commercials. One lady's on this commercial, and she says, I'm 60 years old. She says, I've got a lot of life ahead of me. I'm saying, who says? Who says? I've got a lot of life ahead of me, many years. I'm thinking, who said it? You don't know that you've got that many years left. To be honest, I'm shocked I lived as long as I did. I've seen a lot of times that should have took, should have took me out. It should have. Thank you, God, for letting me. My husband told me, he said, Poop, I'll never live to be an old man. I said, you need to quit saying that. He said, no, all my life I knew that. I'll never live to be old. He died at 54. And I, thought, I used to tell him all the time, just quit saying that. He said, I, I have a gut feeling. He had a brain aneurysm, took him out in a, mo in a moment. So while you're sitting there, my husband wasn't sick, healthy. We just returned home from vacation. He's doing great. Charles was rarely sick. The most he ever had was a cold. But suddenly, the next day, you think your life is going to be just the same. We're back from vacation. He's going to wash the car. He's going to the bank to deposit money in the bank. And, and he said, I'll see you in a few minutes. In a few minutes. It never happened. Brain aneurysm, the main blood vessel at the base of the brain exploded in his head. And I said to the doctor, is there any way we can know when that's what he said? You have, it shows no sign of it. There's nothing that says, oh, I got a horrible headache. Oh, this is what's going on. That, no, it has no sign. So when the, when the doctor brought me the x-rays of my husband, the whole, back of the, the whole back of the brain, you could see this dark, big spot just covering the whole head. In a moment, my life suddenly took a drastic, completely change. Whoa. Today I'm married. A few hours later, I'm a widow. I'm 49 years old. Are you kidding me? Suddenly the things we talked about when he would retire, all of that is gone. All of it. We look forward to the day of the rocking chair when all the kids were out of that house. Never was to be. Just because you make a plan, don't guarantee you you're going to do it. But I'm glad he had a, a, a relationship with the Lord that made it all right. But if that would happen to you today, if you just get up suddenly and just bang, you out of here, where would you go? You better start thanking God and say, Lord, I'm not right. I know I'm not right in my heart. Change my heart. P put your love in me and help me to love you back. Help me to give my life because you gave yours for me. Why wouldn't you want to give it back? 
And it doesn't even require you going to the cross. I just want, I just want you to love me back. God created man because he wanted him as a family. But he doesn't want God. This morning, you must look at your life and say, you know what? And wake up, Milton. And you know what? Yes. I got to have it right. This message came to you, you, and you, and all over here. God's talking to you. Have you, do you appreciate me? How many times you said thank you to me? How many times did you get up in the morning and pray before you went out? We used to sing this song, did you stop to pray this morning as you started on your way? Did you stop just one moment to say thank you? You don't even have to wake up. People go to sleep and never wake up. Look at your life today. Examine it. Check it out. Ain't nobody in here is going to help you on your day of death. It's coming for you and you alone. Think about it. While our singers and musicians are coming forward, I say to everybody in this audience this morning, say, you know, Sister Rose, that's the truth. I rarely say thank you for anything. I find myself complaining a lot. Always complaining about something, but never a thank you for what I have. If you want to complain about, you know, I wish I had more. I wish I had a better job. I wish I had this, had that. Hey, somebody don't have any of those things you already have. Say thank you first. Maybe God will give you something else if you just say thank you. Whatever you want, God's got it. You know, the commercial says, if you want a mattress, Bob's got it. If you need something in your life, God's got it. Give your life to him. God bless you.